Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green. We have a very unusual topic and a very dedicated person to talk about that unusual topic, unusual for this program, that is. Usually we talk about energy efficiency, LED lamps, and so forth. Today we're going to talk about the food energy nexus. Where do we get our blueberries from? the East Coast, where do we get our tomatoes from, sometimes Mexico, sometimes Florida, Lord knows when. Our fruit comes all the way from Florida, even though we're a great cattle ranching venue. Our meat, most of it, comes from the mainland. Where it could be wrong with this picture when you're thinking about climate change and all of the energy that went into producing that fruit or that food now transporting it all the way to Hawaii. There are many, many ways to address climate change, and one of the key, key, key elements in there is changing the way we grow food, where we grow food, and what type of food we eat. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the famous, in certain circles, Dore Shin. Welcome, Dore. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. So you are passionate about many things, one of them being where to grow the food, what type of food to grow, and how to eat it. Please tell us something. So I think I, I've worked in a lot of areas, a lot of mm -hmm. um, various issues on sustainability, a lot of issues on plastic, pollution, and waste. Mm -hmm. And just from the science done on what what are the best ways that consumers can make a positive or negative impact mm -hmm. on the environment and our climate crisis um, is what we eat, you know, and, and how we grow food. And, you know, we can talk about solar panels and, a, and um, you know, our entire energy system and all these other, other things that people talk about. But mm -hmm. the one that we can impact the most as individuals at home without much effort or money um, is what we eat. And so mm -hmm. that's why I'm really passionate about um, talking about food as a way to solve climate change, um, as well as a lot of other interconnected issues. Mm -hmm. So give us some examples. Where do we start? Yeah, so yeah. I mean, the, the number one thing that people don't realize is um, that, you know, animal products, um, especially when industrially produced, which is about, they say, between 90 to 99 percent of the animal products Americans eat mm -hmm. um, are factory farm and industrially produced. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the, the worst things for our environment and account for about, you know, 45 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a pretty large now footprint. Let, let me throw out a statistic yeah. and see if I'm right. Okay. To raise one pound of beef yeah. requires a thousand gallons of water. Yeah, so actually yeah. for one pound of beef, I the first statistic I saw on that was that it's 5,000 gallons of water, mm -hmm. and that was in California. So mm -hmm. it does depend on the region that it's grown. And of course, factory farming will always be a little bit worse because it's so unnatural. Mm -hmm. And so just the water alone required mm -hmm. is so significant. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the water footprint for beef and other animal products is not in what the animals are drinking, really. Really, most of it comes from growing the food for the animals, mm -hmm. um, which is the corn and soy and most of that being GMO and full of pesticides. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mentioned interconnectedness, and because it does connect to so many other environmental and justice issues. Yeah. Pesticides and herbicides, I believe. Yes, yep. totally. Yep. And yep. antibiotics and hormones. <laughs> and so and it's yep. just yep. so, you know, so good for not only animal welfare, which is a big reason to, you know, reduce animal um, <clears throat> consumption, but just, you know, solving our climate crisis and a lot of the health issues associated with what we eat. Now, some, another word that comes to mind as you speak is methane. What about methane? Yeah, so they say <laughs> methane is, depending on what uh, numbers you look at, is about 26 times more powerful than CO2. Mm -hmm. And it has a longer lasting effect on the environment than CO2. Mm -hmm. But CO2, to carbon dioxide is really the only greenhouse gas that's widely talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the main source of methane in our greenhouse gas emissions 
profile from hum human activity is from growing animals for food. And so it's just really important that we address, you know, this mm -hmm. issue specifically because it's one that I've particularly noticed as a sustainability professional mm -hmm. that people don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. We're still serving factory farm meat at our events. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, people want to talk about plastic straws, but they don't want to talk about food consumption and um, they feel mm -hmm. it's a personal attack, but really it's not a personal issue. It's just a reality issue. And let's just face what's going on in our environment and what we can best do solve it. And the connection between the animals we're raising and methane is? Yeah, so the animals we raise release mm -hmm. a lot of methane just from mm -hmm. being alive. They're burping and farting mm -hmm. and um, they just release a lot of methane and one cow is, you know, a, mm -hmm. more than a lot of humans. And so, um, you know, we have 7 billion people on planet Earth and that's mm -hmm. just the human population. But the amount of land animals we kill alone is above 70 billion animals per year. Mm -hmm. So people think that there's a human overpopulation issue, which is somewhat true, but really what mm -hmm. the deeper issue is, the more problematic thing, is the humans eating animals issue. And it's, mm -hmm. we kill 10 mm -hmm. times more animals than humans that even live on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And the impact of each of those animals having to be fed um, and all the suffering from the nature perspective and from the animal perspective mm -hmm. associated with it is um, it's just excessive and it's very unnecessary at the rate in, in which humans are consuming animal products. And when we look at the that 7 billion or 7.5 billion people on Earth, you can divide that into two very distinct groups. The rich people, yeah. about, which is you and me, mm -hmm. that's about 1 billion, and then the 6.5 rest of them and we rich people in the industrial countries, U.S., Canada, Japan, Western Europe, mm -hmm. we consume a heck of a lot more meat generally totally. than uh, do, do the poorer people on Earth. Yeah, so the yeah. more advanced nations will be, always be consuming more animal products because mm -hmm. it becomes accessible to them in a global market. And another issue around this is just like government subsidies. And if you mm -hmm. look at where... I mean, it's billions of dollars that our U.S. government specifically subsidizes food, and it's all mm -hmm. going to, essentially, it's going to the meat and dairy industries. Mm -hmm. It's also going to GMO corn and soy, which is the food that's being fed to animals and all mm -hmm. the junk food. So, you know, subsidies rarely, it's, it's, I think it's 1% or 2% go to fruit and vegetable production, um, mm -hmm. let alone organic farming. And so imagine if those subsidies were switched, um, because right now they say that the cost of a Big Mac is supposed to be $11 mm -hmm. if it wasn't subsidized and if it, if it brought in the negative externalities associated mm -hmm. with producing the, that mm -hmm. kind of food. Um, so, yeah, I think that it would be really powerful to shift our economy and say, you know, we're going to subsidize food that's good for the earth and good for people, make mm -hmm. organic mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables really cheap, mm -hmm. um, support that kind of farming, and then start to slow down the support of the type of farming and food production that's really unsustainable and not going to last us and many more generations. Mm -hmm. And let me throw in two factors here. There, every year there's more and more and more and more money on yeah. the face of this earth. We have some, compared to 1950, I think there's 15 times more dollars than there was back then. And I am not an economist. I don't understand how it just continues to grow. But the biggest example of that is China, where under Mao, mm -hmm. the per capita income was something like $70 a year. Yeah. They were, they were totally subsistence economy. Now the average income is around six seven thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. so there's an explosion of middle class people right. in china like 500 million of them twice our po um, one and a half times our population mm -hmm. and as they get richer what do they want to do they want to eat more meat yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. well what's cool about it right yeah. now is mm -hmm. i know people who you know went vegan vegetarian 40 years ago mm -hmm. and there was no soy milk in the grocery store that's mm -hmm. what they told me you know they had to make everything from scratch but now you see companies like beyond meat you know and they've mm -hmm. had the mm -hmm. most successful um, stock market introduction of their um, stock um starting at 25 dollars. now it's mm -hmm. well over a hundred dollars that's kind of unheard of and that's a plant-based burger and sausage company Impossible mm -hmm. Burger is another vegan burger mm -hmm. that Google tried to buy for $100 million. Mm -hmm. So you see that 
This is an undeniable trend and it's really going to be unstoppable because the truth is out there and people recognize that, you know, we can, we can prevent most of the chronic diseases that most people die from, like heart disease mm -hmm. and diabetes, and we can potentially save our planet um, mm -hmm. with just one swift move of deciding we're not going to allow industrial meat and factory farming to be a primary source of um, food for, mm -hmm. our, for our society because it's really stealing from our future and it's mm -hmm. just not fair well, when you look at where our environmental situation you know, is right now. We have it uh, pretty good. I speak as a very mature person. Uh, you know, I won't be on this planet for all that much longer, but you're going to be on, you're going to be going strong 50, 60 years from Hopefully now. Hopefully more, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so the two uh, vegetable-based meat companies that you mentioned, I believe, well, I know from personal experience, the veggie burgers that you used to have, maybe just me, yeah. but you try to eat them and it's like uh, mushy cardboard. I understand that these new types of meat actually taste like meat. Yeah, they do. And mm -hmm. I, I come from, you know, a family where we did eat meat and mm -hmm. I chose to not do it from a values perspective. I said, this is not something that I could actually do myself or agree mm -hmm. with. And so when I did it, it was just for that reason. But I still like the taste of it, mm -hmm. you know, and um, if it wasn't so terrible for the environment and animals, I probably would still be eating mm -hmm. meat. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's you, you, I learned, I was, you know, happily surprised that all the animal products I used to enjoy, um, I didn't feel like I lost that experience because I mm -hmm. still I have coconut yogurt, um, vegan cheeses, mm -hmm. I have vegan sausages in my pasta. We, you know, I eat veggie burgers all the time and they all taste amazing. And I, and I don't, you know, remember ever feeling like, oh, this is like a terrible alternative because yeah, it's you're getting better deprived, every year. Yeah. yeah. So have, have you tasted the meats from the two companies, Impossible? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So it had been like um, over 10 years since I've eaten meat and it mm -hmm. was like so weird. I what was at the counter, the counter in Kahala um, is one of the places that has the Impossible mm -hmm. Burger. And we l had to like double check, like, are you sure? Because this yeah, looks like really yeah, and it yeah, tastes yeah. really because me and my friends were we were all vegan and they were like, no, this is the one, we're sure. I've had that happen multiple times at restaurants. Like, this really looks like meat. I'm kind of nervous that you gave me the wrong thing. Um, but wow. that's how uh, convincing these things are becoming. And there really is no, ch it's such a privilege that we can have the same experience mm -hmm. and we have these options and choices now. And so I think that's where, as individuals and as a society, we have a greater responsibility to take advantage of that privilege mm -hmm. and these choices and make the better choices and not live so passively through life. Now, I'm getting that there are several outlets for these two types of meat in here in Honolulu? Or, yeah. yeah. So the Beyond Meat burgers, um, they're sold like everywhere. You can find them at really? Safeway even. Yeah. But most like down to earth, Whole Foods, those places will always have them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Safeway now has a ton of uh, plant-based meat alternatives in their fridges. Really? Health food stores will always have the mm -hmm. most amount mm -hmm. of options. Um, but I would re definitely recommend for people who still like really like the taste of meat, mm -hmm. the Beyond Meat um, company is good. The mm -hmm. Impossible Burger is still kind of rolling out. So they're not... Wow as accessible but there are a handful of restaurants here that mm. sell it in their on their menu and you would think that that would be a a kind of a sales item special beyond meat yeah, yeah try it out you're yeah. seeing it i mean they sell yeah. beyond meat at carl's jr's and they're um, launching it really? they're launching the impossible burger at all burger kings um and you'll and i've seen it like on the Kahala Resort restaurant, like all these random restaurants I go to now have the Beyond Meat Burger. Really? It's been everywhere. So it's it's going to continue to blow up and it's going to continue mm. to be accessible and available for people who choose to eat meat or not, oh. but just as an alternative for one of your meals of the day. Yeah, we've got to take a break, but it um, sounds like it's everywhere. And the people who invested the IPO money, I think... Yeah. They're getting their, their money back. Absolutely. Well, on that very cheery note, we need to take a break. Think Tech Hawaii Code Green, Doreen, Dore Shin, back in a moment. Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, a host here on Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness here on the island. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Mahalo. 
Aloha, I'm Dennis Wong, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Good afternoon again, Howard Wig, Code Green, Sync Tech Hawaii, having a very, very animated conversation with Dore Shin, environmental activist extraordinaire. We've been talking about the food revolution, and I had no idea that Impossible Meats and so forth was getting widespread in Hawaii. I hope the, the word gets out about that. Now, now you're making me go out and, and uh, try this. Yeah, why not? Let's shift topics to the oceans. Here we are, the only state in the nation surrounded by ocean. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit of uh, personal background. I worked with several other people many, many years ago. We worked with the Coast Guard, H Power, Hawaii Metal Recycling, a whole bunch of people, mm -hmm. and we harvested drift net and yeah. tangled up fishing net and all kinds of other debris from the Pacific Northwest Islands, brought them to Pearl Harbor. Uh, what was that? Hawaii Metals Recycling would take all of that junk yeah. from the ship on the trucks, take it to Hawaii Metal Recycling, Shut it chop up. it up into sort of bite-sized chunks, mm -hmm. and then ship it up to H Power, burn it, make electricity. Yeah. So that was one of the first success stories regarding uh, marine debris. Yeah. And I believe we, it also started in Oregon and in Massachusetts. Nice. But you have a whole bunch of other things to talk about, but start on your Yeah, no, your I think that's a good place thing. to start. Yeah. I think yeah. um, fishing nets, we, we know in Hawaii, anyone who's cleaned the beaches mm -hmm. here on a regular basis, I'm with Surf Rider Foundation, there's Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, Plastic Free Hawaii, 808 mm -hmm. Cleanups. Um, we know that what washes up most, and we say it's mm -hmm. a bit over 90%, you know, it's virtually all, if you look at the volume, is commercial fishing gear. That's mm -hmm. what's washing ashore. There are beaches on the south side or the west side where it's land-based trash, which is always mm -hmm. going to be a problem from wind-blown trash cans or just people littering still. Um, but we know that the biggest problem facing our beaches is commercial fishing gear. And like mm -hmm. you said, it's fishing nets. And these things are coming mm -hmm. in um, in mass. You know, at Kahuku, we'll get 7,000 pounds in an mm -hmm. hour and a half with 100 volunteers. Mm -hmm. With the same number of volunteers in the same amount of time, on the same day in Kailua, you'll get 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. So you see the vast difference you get. Both are marine debris. Kailua is going to see mostly microplastics. But in both cases, it's almost all commercial fishing gear. So um, mm -hmm. Fishing nets, ropes, um, buoys, and hagfish traps, anything aquaculture related. So something that's really important that we've all been raising more awareness about because of what we see statistically on our beaches mm -hmm. is that we always say with plastic, because it's something that people are becoming aware of, um, using less plastic. And, mm -hmm. and the straw thing is such a big thing because of that video of the turtle with the straw stuck mm -hmm. in its nose. Mm -hmm. um, but if you really look at the volume of what's impacting our oceans, they say in the ocean, about half is fishing nets alone, mm -hmm. just nets. Um, so. If we're saying refuse plastic and reduce plastic, we also have to recognize the equivalent solution when it comes to the commercial fishing industry, which is to refuse commercial fish and reduce and or reduce the amount we're demanding because mm -hmm. it's the mm -hmm. supply and demand economy um, and companies respond to that. And so uh, we've seen it historically work with every other social and environmental movement. So we know that this supply and demand effort um, will really make a positive solution just as it has with plastic. Um, mm -hmm. We have to do the same with fish and seafood here. And I wonder if the impossible meat people are trying to 
to create a, a fish equivalent of any sort or a crab equivalent. Yeah, there are yeah. like um, tomato-based sushis. I've never tried them, but mm. I've heard really My good goodness. things. Um, there are like fish um, fish fillets that companies like Gardein makes. All these things are available in the freezer section at your health food store, local health mm. food store, like down to earth or Whole Foods. Um, I'm sure in terms of like alternatives to fish, they'll just get keep getting better. Yeah. I don't yeah. think they're yeah. as yeah. far along as meat alternatives. Um, but there is like Honolulu has a brand new vegan sushi spot. It's quite fancy and impressive. Mm. Um, and it's called Tane Vegan. They come from San Francisco where they have a long line out their door every single day. My and goodness. it's just as popular in Honolulu now. It's super amazing, very impressive. Is that in Waikiki? Or? Um, no, it's in Honolulu, just like off of uh, Macaulay and Baratania area. Mm. Tane, T-A-N-E. It's really good. So. You know, there's there's always going to be an increase in alternatives, but at the very least, reducing what you are eating, or at mm -hmm. least only eating fish if it's um, from a small boat fisherman, or if it's from a place like local Ia. Um, if you are still committed to eating it, I think there are some alternatives. There's just really not that many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, how, what's your stand on aquaculture? Um, like farmed fishing, mm -hmm. you mean? I think from an environmental perspective, it's objectively better just because mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get the bycatch, um, which is just the loss of wildlife. You know, yeah, they say yeah, yeah. for every one targeted fish, like a tuna, you're going to get five other animals killed mm -hmm. in a traditional commercial fishing process. Um, so I think aquaculture prevents that, but it also has its own issues because a lot of it is GMO fed. Um, mm -hmm. So you're going to get that GMO corn and soy that they feed mm -hmm. to animals, mm -hmm. um, which has its, all of its own environmental issues. So I don't, I'm not an expert on that, but I do know that there's pros and cons to farmed fish. I'm sure there are good mm -hmm. ways to do it, but it is kind of like an equivalent of factory farming. So there's definitely some consequences to consider before we um, rapidly shift. And I think mm -hmm. that one thing to consider is people are always looking for, like when it comes to beef, every, you know, everyone wants to just eat grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. But the reality is like that's way more expensive. And even though it's a little better from certain perspectives, it's still not feasible to sustain the current consumption rate um, with yeah. that style of raising meat. And it's the same with fish. It's really the consumption rate we're at when it comes to animal products is just too high. Mm -hmm. There are good alternatives, but not, not at the rate at which we're eating it. So no matter what, as a society, we have to reduce the demand mm -hmm. and the consumption rate. And then I think we can look at what alternatives exist that do align with our values. Yeah, but then you get into that, that S word, sacrifice. We must sacrifice. And yeah. we're in a boom economy. Everything's rosy from us, middle class standpoint. Yeah. And nobody would like to sacrifice. And unlike yourself and myself, most people don't think that we should launch a World War II type effort to completely turn the economy around. Yeah. So I get back to good tasting uh, alternatives. Totally. Uh, and, and, and another thing that occurred to me is the plastic food nexus. When you go around the uh, perimeter of a supermarket, mm -hmm. you have your produce over here, yeah. and the produce is just sitting there. You put it in one little uh, clear plastic bag, mm -hmm. and your meats and everything are over there, and they're just very, very, very simply packaged. Mm -hmm. You go into the middle of the supermarket with all the processed food, and you get the exterior packaging and then the interior packaging and more packaging. Right. So the closer you are to eating raw food, yeah. the, the less packaging, the less plastic uh, you have. Yeah, I think yeah. The, the zero waste movement gives a clear signal also to having a more plant-based diet. Because when mm -hmm. you go into that, um, you realize that whole foods and um, like you know, whole fruits and vegetables, that's mm -hmm. the stuff that you can get without packaging. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's kind of all interconnected. And that's kind of what I realized throughout my, my personal journey, becoming an environmentalist, starting with plastic and stop mm -hmm. not using water bottles and bringing my own utensil and then realizing like maybe I should go vegan and just kind of continuing down this path. Um, you just realize that everything's interconnected. And, and when you do one thing, it kind of automatically leads into another. Um, and it becomes more of an effortless uh, lifestyle because mm -hmm. You know, you're in alignment with your values, you're much happier, you're making good choices, you're probably shopping more at farmer's markets mm -hmm. and local co-ops or health food stores. So 
it ends up feeling really, really good on top of, you know, once you get through the um, stage where you have to put a little bit of effort into changing your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the word co-op. Might we have a co-op in town? We have a co-op. It's called <laughs> Kokua Market. Yes. It's the only co-op in Honolulu, mm -hmm. and it started in the 70s by some idealistic environmentalists at the time. Mm -hmm. um, right now, you know, Amazon and Whole Foods, they are pushing out places like Cocoa Market and Down to Earth. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most recent reports I've been getting. They're both struggling. These are our local health food stores. So I, I feel, you know, all of this, what we're talking about, consumption patterns, you know, pushing out of local businesses, this all connects to, you know, how does our culture of capitalism and convenience, mm -hmm. you know, weigh down on our values mm -hmm. and kind of suppress our values from coming to the surface. So that's why I think changing our lifestyle so that they're out of the status quo, it might make you or other people uncomfortable a little bit to be zero waste and eat more vegan and do all these things but we need to move away from our current culture because our current culture and government and economic system have gotten us into a crisis a climate mm -hmm. crisis health crisis social crisis so we need to try other things because mm -hmm. what we've been doing it's really not working and if we don't change now yesterday mm -hmm. you know it's it's we you know where do we find hope for our future and mm -hmm. and, and, and and our children's future yeah and grandchildren's future yeah and something i tell people is like you know yeah. we inherited this culture it's not mm -hmm. like we are born into it nobody asked us hey do you want to use plastic every day and eat factory farmed meat or do you want this you know mm -hmm. like eat from an organic farm like people didn't really give us choices for the most part we just got we inherited this culture. It's very mm -hmm. unsustainable. So it's going to take us some effort to get to our alternative yeah. lifestyle, but I think it's imperative that we do so. And a little related factor, uh, Japan and Western Europe have approximately the same lifestyle that we do. They're just as wealthy per capita income as yeah. we are. Western Europe, I think, uses about half as much energy per capita mm -hmm. as do we, and Japan about a third as much energy per capita. Yeah, and yep. I think that really shows how people in the United States, it's this American culture mm -hmm. of, you know, m more, more mm -hmm. is better, mm -hmm. and people eat more here, we get sick more, mm -hmm. you know, we drive bigger cars, and, you know, it's just very excessive. And so I think we can look at advanced countries who are healthier and more sustainable mm -hmm. than ours and say, like, you know, how can we shift? to, you know, emulate these countries that maybe we should become a little bit more like. And on a very cheery, very final note, when we eat more like you, we look more like you, we, are, we have a, an obesity epidemic, and we see little kids, you know, five, yeah. six-year-old kids that are already getting overweight, and if you went to their home and watched what they eat, oh, it's... ooh, yeah, you'd see immediately. Yeah, they, the, I saw yeah. that it's 68% of Americans are obese mm -hmm. or overweight, and that's just, you know, too much, I think. Yes, so yes. health is also a big benefit to all of these things. Big benefit, and on that very cheery note, we must bid fond adieu. Thank you so much, Duray. See you next time, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii.